There's a lot that I like about the Institute of Politics. I like the, the people here, the architecture, well, uh, it's dripping over there, but I like the food. But most of all, what I like about the Institute is that it breaks down the barriers between student life and the real world of politics. And we've all read about the campaigns and studied government and classes and seen Dan Rather and George Bush fight it out on TV. But rarely have we had the chance to get a first-hand perspective of what politics is really all about. It's a lot more than just making speeches and uh, getting votes. There's a very important human and personal aspect that's often overlooked entirely. And tonight, we have a very diverse and distinguished group of people who have experienced politics in all its different facets. And we're going to hear their perspectives, their personal perspectives tonight. Each speaker is going to talk uh, from five to seven minutes about his own personal feelings. And then once all that is done, the, the floor will be open for questions and answers, so there'll be quite a bit of interchange after that. Dick Thornburg is the, well, was the, the governor of Pennsylvania until this academic year. And he gave up his, his position just to be the, our director. <laughs> anyway, uh, he is going to be our moderator tonight. And as such, I'm turning things over to him. Governor? Thank you, John, very much. Well, welcome to you all. It's always a pleasure to welcome you to the forum uh, of the John F. Kennedy School of Government, where the Institute of Politics is privileged uh, from time to time to host uh, important discussions about issues of the day, interchanges, uh, controversial and otherwise, on subjects that are of interest uh, to all American citizens. But this is a very special night because it gives us the opportunity to introduce to you some very special people, people who have a zest and an enthusiasm for public life, who are here as resident fellows this semester to share with you some of their experiences and insights, some of their hopes and fears, some of their accomplishments and disappointments. And my expectation, and certainly my hope is, that in not only hearing our fellows this evening, but in participating in their study groups throughout this semester, in chatting with them in their offices, in passing them in the halls, and perhaps sharing a meal with them uh, from time to time uh, in one setting or another, some of that zest and enthusiasm will be transmitted to you who most of you here this evening are part of that next generation of leaders that this United States of America is going to have to depend upon. To you and to our other guests uh, this evening, I want to extend a hearty welcome. Our format uh, this evening is very simple. We will hear in somewhat random fashion from each of our fellows uh, who will uh, share with you uh, some of their uh, uh, views about public life and about elective office in particular. And then uh, we'll open the floor to questioning and hope to have a very warm and uh, worthwhile exchange uh, uh, so long as uh, time allows. Afterwards, we will be uh, uh, all guests at a reception hosted for the new fellows by the Student Advisory Committee. And I want to thank John Bender and the members of the Student Advisory Committee and others who have helped to make this a successful year and helped to give me a sense of uh, what an exciting place this is to be. It's a great pleasure to be here as the director and to have the chance to welcome you all. Well, let's get on to the business at hand. I'm going to kick off uh, this evening with the gentleman to my right, Ed Fui, who uh, is the head of the elections unit at NBC. He has been a broadcast news executive for all three of the major networks during his career. He has served uh, in New York, in Washington, and for a time in Saigon. 
and he will be conducting a study group uh, this semester entitled, very non-controversial, just kind of bland, The Press and the Primaries, Campaign 88. Ed, welcome to the Institute of Politics. Thank you, Dick. I, I'm, uh, I wanted to say first that I am absolutely astonished that there are this many Americans who do not watch Bill Cosby on Thursday night. I had no idea. But I, as I look out at all your bright, intense, young faces, uh, I'm put into mind of a story that Mark Twain used to, used to be fond of, of telling. It, it was a story about a missionary who was sent out to save the souls of the savages. And uh, as Twain told the story, the, uh, the missionary gathered all of the savages uh, in his newly constructed church. Uh, he gave them his pitch. They listened very respectfully, and then they ate him. <laughs> I'm not suggesting that you're savages, or I, I'm certainly not a missionary, but I, I did want to say that uh, those of you who came armed with knives and forks tonight are under surveillance by the university police. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit uh, more about myself and, and career uh, because that's what I was asked to, to do since I'm not a, a politician and never have held elective office. I ran for, uh, for student body president and my guys got to count the votes and even so I lost. So I got out of politics from an active standpoint at an early age. But I did, I was fortunate enough to grow up in, in what I think was a kind of a golden age of journalism and that's what I'd like to talk a little bit about tonight and that was during World War II when the link between the people at home and the, and, the, and the men at the front were, were men like uh, Edward R. Morrow and, and Ernie Pyle. And they made the, the craft, the trade of reporting the news kind of respectable. Um, and my timing was good when I went off to college. Uh, I went to college at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst and I found out just as I went off as a freshman that the, the Western Massachusetts correspondent of the Boston Globe had quit. So I applied for his job and I got it. And uh, pretty soon I, I was covering news and sports, primarily the latter because it, because it paid better. And after a while I became a stringer for the Associated Press and the Hartford Current and some other newspapers. And I, I liked it. I liked it very much. Even when, as a senior in college, I was called to the scene of an automobile accident in the middle of the day and uh, I found that a man was, uh, had been killed and there was a priest administering the last rites uh, at the time. And as I saw that, uh, I lost my lunch, much to the amusement of the cops who were on the scene. And I almost uh, decided to go into some other line of work on that day, but I've learned to uh, keep my lunch down since then. My timing was good again when I, when I uh, joined the Marine Corps out of college and, and found myself in, uh, commanding an infantry platoon that President Eisenhower, yes, I'm that old, uh, sent to um, pacify Lebanon. Uh, the operation was uh, intensively covered by the news media, although after the first week or so there wasn't much of a war. The Lebanese were sort of saving themselves for the civil war that they had later on. Uh, but I commanded a patrol that ran the Beirut-Damascus Highway every day, and, and a lot of the newsmen who were based in Beirut um, came along at one time or another, and I found them a very engaging lot, and they were living in the St. George Hotel in the lap of luxury while I was living in a tent. And I thought that journalism was, as I had as, uh, suspected earlier, a very interesting way to make a living. Once out of uniform, I tried to get my old job back at the Globe, and I called the city editor, and I said, uh, here I am. And he said, well, the Harvard boys are here now, it being the summer. But he said, they'll go back to school in the fall and, and, and apply then, and uh, maybe we'll take you back. And uh, so I went off and I got a job at a television station just to keep myself busy for the summer. And, and sure enough, they called back in the fall and, and uh, they said, well, you can come and have your old job back. But I found that I liked TV news uh, at that point. But I decided to counsel with my cousin, who was the city editor of the Boston, um, the Hearst newspaper, now the forerunner of the Boston Herald American. And he said, you know, I think that maybe newspapers have seen their best days and uh, maybe ought to stay in TV, which was a remarkable piece of advice from a newspaper man in 1961, but it turned out to be good advice. And I stayed on and learned the trade of being a television producer and from a really remarkable group of people. And we sort of invented the form as we went along and uh, the production techniques and the, and the editorial techniques that are now very common we were, we were learning about in those days. But again, my timing was good when uh, about the middle of the decade I went off to CBS News where there was a terrific story and I got to cover it. It was the Civil Rights Revolution that was sweeping the South and uh, I got to cover the Selma to Montgomery March and I met and, and covered uh, Martin Luther King and as that story sort of wound down, the war in Vietnam was getting hot and I got an opportunity to go over there. Um, uh, I was offered the job of, um, of bureau chief at CBS News and uh, 
I took it. I thought there was a lot of competition for the job. As it turned out, I was the only candidate for reasons I learned later. Um, in retrospect, 1967 was a crucial time uh, for the war because uh, public opinion was just beginning to turn against it. There were major campaigns that I got to cover in, along the Cambodian border in a town called Dak Tho and up in the DMZ, Kantian and Quezon, names that became household words. Um, and the historians who are writing about the war now say that those were crucial battles. We didn't know that at the time. There was an election uh, that year as well, and uh, even though the government people got to count the votes, it was a fairly honest election, and it gave us, covering that, gave us a respite from the war. And I get back just in time to cover the violent campus demonstrations at Berkeley and San Francisco State. And I was in Los Angeles the night Bobby Kennedy was shot, and I was a producer in charge of the coverage of the Hilton Hotel in Chicago at the 68 Democratic Convention. So journalism has really given me a front row seat at a lot of great events. Again, the timing was good. Um, I came, came to Washington, went to Washington uh, with the Nixon administration, and President Nixon traveled very widely, and including, uh, and I went with him everywhere he went. Uh, we went to China in 1972, which was a very exciting time to go there. When Watergate uh, broke, I was calling the shots on the coverage, and we went after that story like pit bulls. And I developed a taste for investigative reporting, and, and along with Bob Pierpoint, my close friend then and now, a man who I had met first in Lebanon, uh, we were able to break stories about uh, B.B. Rebozo, who was Nixon's close friend, and his use of political influence to uh, further his banking business. By the 76 campaign, I was uh, at... at NBC, where I was senior producer of Nightly News, and I, I travel very widely with uh, John Chancellor, who was then and is now one of the wisest heads covering American politics. A year earlier, I had been in Spain when uh, Francisco Franco went through his very long, if you remember, protracted illness. Uh, he was a durable dictator, and it turned out he was a durable patient, and he lingered on his deathbed for many, many days. It was not a bad story to cover, but um, it got a little boring. But it was clear that Franco was going to die. Um, the Spanish, I, was, I did a, a satellite feed out of Madrid television one night, and afterward the, the Spanish TV newsman approached me and said uh, they were a little bit scared and, and very excited because they knew that when Franco died, their, their whole world was going to change and they would be able to report news and not just propaganda. And their question to me was, what's it like to work in a free society? And I didn't really have a very good answer for that. And I tried to answer it, but I hadn't really given it very much thought. So I resolved that night to, to give it more thought. And I've been thinking about that sort of thing and First Amendment issues um, a lot since then. And that was good because it, uh, in, it, I returned to CBS and, and I was the Washington bureau chief in the latter part of the Carter administration, 1979 and 80, when the hostages were held in, in Iran. Um, the, the White House was also engaged in a, in a, in a fierce re-election battle, if you recall. And they were very touchy about what we said and what we reported, and we had many very tough battles with them. But one that stands out very much in my mind was one that occurred over a story that we had prepared on SAVAK, the Shah's uh, secret police. The White House somehow learned that we were going to broadcast this piece, and I received a call from the Secretary of State, uh, who said that the broadcast of the story would endanger the lives of the hostages. But his evidence for that assertion was rather thin, I thought. Um, I reported the conversation to my boss, who at the time was the president of CBS News, Bill Leonard. And shortly thereafter, Bill called to say that he had just received a call from President Carter. It seems that Mr. Vance had doubted uh, accurately that he had persuaded me to kill the story, so he was going over my head. Uh, so Bill uh, heard out the president and thought it over, talked to me and to others, and later decided that we would go ahead and broadcast that story. When I came to work that Monday, um, following the broadcast, uh, as I walked down the street to my um, bureau, I was struck with the thought that in any other nation in the world, the building would have been surrounded by tanks and I probably would have been arrested. Um, it, later, I, I went, uh, became news director of CBS News, and, uh, and the foreign bureaus were part of my responsibility. And I went to Central America to the, the bureau in Salvador shortly after Bill Stewart of ABC had been shot dead in Nicaragua. I went to make a first-hand assessment of the dangers to people who were covering the story. And while I was in uh, Salvador, three Dutch journalists, you may remember, were murdered. Um, so I found myself then in the uncomfortable role of, of seeking help from the White House to protect our people and, uh, who were out there covering the war. I don't know if they ever did anything after our representations, but thank goodness no, no American journalist has been killed in uh, Central America since. All of these incidents came against a backdrop of the growing influence and pervasiveness of television news, and all of it made me think more deeply about the relationship between the press and the government. 
For example, does the, does the White House have the right to command all three television networks to devote their facilities to a presidential address when he, the president, deems it in the national interest? At times, I thought the answer to that question was clearly no. That was an answer the White House didn't like very much, and I felt their wrath in two administrations, one Republican and one Democratic. But now that answer, as we learned this week, has become rather common, and I'm wondering if standing up for journalistic purity, which I thought I was doing, I didn't unwittingly contribute to the undermining of presidential authority that has created some of the present stalemate in our political system. All of this brings us to today and the role the press is playing in the presidential selection process. We all read in a serious newspaper this morning that network news is obsolete, people find the programs boring, the forum has to be reinvented. New producers have to be brought in who don't have traditionalist views. Um, there are guys who disdain serious newsmen. They call them people who wear letter sweaters with a big J, apparently for journalism, on their back. Those kinds of people are apparently out of fashion. If so, what is there to replace network news? How in a gigantic, diverse, busy, um, heterogeneous country where government depends on the consent of the governed, is the government going to communicate with people? Where are people who've long since stopped reading going to get the information they need to make informed decisions? Is there any real reason why the press, if it isn't serious in this role, should be given the constitutional protection that it alone, among all our institutions, both public and private, now enjoys? A few of the questions that I'll be thinking about and talking about here at Harvard as long as I don't get eaten. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Ed Fui. I, I think the only lingering question is after all that travel and your journeys around the world, how we're going to ever be able to keep you in one place here for four months. But I must assure you that those of us who have run for and held public office will be glad to have you as a captive audience. <laughs> Our second speaker is Harriet Michelle, who is uh, resigning as president of the New York Urban League after five years of distinguished service. She brings a broad background of involvement in public life to her fellowship here at the Institute of Politics. She served in the Carter administration as director of the United States Department of Labor's Office of Community Youth Employment and is a present member of the New York City Charter Revision Commission, which is going to keep her interest uh, in the city of New York at a very high level. The New York Urban League is the largest human service agency in that city, serving black citizens with over 70,000 clients annually. But Harriet's present here, presence here, in spite of all that distinguished recommendation, results from one simple fact. She and I come from the same hometown of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Harriet Michelle. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Dick. Uh, Ed has already raised an issue about press and politics, and that's equal time. <laughs> I will uh, take my five to seven minutes and tell you uh, a couple of things that happened in my life that, uh, that uh, galvanized me and brought me into uh, politics in the public sector. We were told to think about those incidents, and I said to someone, you know that we live such convoluted lives and such schizophrenic lives that we have a tendency to forget some of the things that we've undergone. One of the things that Dick didn't say is that he, his wife and I, his wife Jenny and I also have something in common. We were exchange students um, in the American Field Service uh, around the same time. I, and it is through that I want to uh, mention the first incident that happened to me that probably got me on this course of being involved in politics. I went to Norway as an exchange student in 1958. And um, I'm from, Dick exaggerated just a little bit, he may be from Pittsburgh, but I'm from a small town outside of Pittsburgh whose only reason for being was a steel mill and the airport, the greater, New York, uh, the greater Pittsburgh airport. And I was plucked from that community, having, having never gone anywhere or very few places in the United States, to take up residence in uh, Norway in a small community that was north of the Arctic Circle. Uh, and I was so exotic uh, to the Norwegians that um, I, literally I had people used to uh, rub my skin to see if my color came off and they would like to clip 
pieces of my hair because my hair was so dark. In any event, uh, the family uh, uh, with which I lived, the father was the local sheriff, and because of his role, uh, every evening all of the townsmen came together to discuss current events. And one night uh, when the men were there, uh, there was a broadcast coming from Russia in English uh, about the civil rights uh, incident in Little Rock. Um, it had been a year after the integration of Little Rock, and, and Ernest Green, one of the Little Rock Nine, had, had just been graduated from Little Rock High School. And uh, there was the propaganda about, the, about race relations in the United States was exceedingly intense. And these men were very curious. I was the first black person they had ever met. And so at the tender age of 17, I was then asked to comment on race relations in the United States. Well, if you grow up in Western Pennsylvania, you think about lots of things, but at that time, believe it or not, race relations was not, was not among the things that we discussed. So I found for the first time in my life, and I think I've continued that always, in the position of, of articulating the hopes, the problems, the aspirations, and the dreams of the black community to a broader community, and I have stayed on that course. The second thing in my life that galvanized me was, um, uh, after that experience as an exchange student and having absolutely wonderful time, I decided I wanted to come back and be a scholar. So I applied to a variety of colleges, and I ended up at a school called Juniata College in Huntington, Pennsylvania. And every time I go somewhere, people always want to call it Juanita or something, because nobody ever has heard of it. And when people ask me about that college, uh, they say, what was it like? And I say, did you see the movie Witness? You know how grim and dreary? It was almost like that. Uh, uh, Juniata College is run by the Church of the Brethren, and they have eight colleges around the country, and they were looking to integrate. So because they gave me a, a full scholarship, and I, then as now, I suppose, your body goes to the highest bidder when you're going off to college, I took a full scholarship, and off I went to Juniata College. What made that such a special experience for me is that uh, in the four years I was there, I was the only black student. There were no black students. There was no black faculty. There were no black people in the kitchen. There were no black people in the town. I was it. <laughs> and it, it was such, first of all, having, having been abroad and, and been an exchange student, th that made me exotic enough. But then being, being black too, and most of the youngsters who were there had come off of small towns uh, and farms in Pennsylvania, they kept asking me what country I was from. Now, I was from western Pennsylvania, but in order to accept me, uh, it, it became easier to make me something else. And so for the four years that I was at Juniata College, I then again spent my entire time explaining issues, hopes, dreams, aspirations of the black community to a larger community that was fairly unsophisticated. I have been lucky in my life. I think when you hear my fellow fellows speak, you realize that, that very few of us started out with a game plan. Uh, most of what we have become has been serendipitous at best. Um, and and a lot of it is timing. Ed mentioned timing so many, uh, so, in so many junctures in his speech. It is timing. I have been lucky enough, without ever having run for public office, to be in positions where the, uh, uh, my feelings and thoughts uh, uh, have influenced, greatly influenced the development of public policy. Um, I uh, here am going to uh, do a course on black leadership because I think as in the broader community, the black community certainly is in a leadership crisis and while I can discuss lots of things with you and I'd be happy to, I think the black community in the United States is at an important crossroads and we need to look very carefully at the issue of leadership and I'd be happy to share my thoughts with any and all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Harriet. Thank you, Harriet, very much. I uh, took a lot of time giving people the benefit of your background and qualifications. I guess I can add another one. If you weren't Miss Norway of 1958, you sure ought to have been. <laughs> Harriet Michelle will be, uh, as she indicated, offering a study group entitled Emerging Patterns in Black Leadership Challenge to Mainstream Blacks. And I think you can see that she's eminently qualified to deliver her views on that. The third fellow I want to introduce this evening is Clarence J. Bud Brown from Ohio. Served nine terms in the United States House of Representatives, but even more importantly than that, between his father, the, the real Clarence Brown, and Bud, uh, that congressional seat was held for 44 years between father and son. 
So the knowledge that he's accrued over the years of service in the House of Representatives is added to the fact that he ran as the Republican candidate for governor of Ohio in 1982 and most recently served as Deputy Secretary of Commerce during the past five years where he was intimately involved with problems relating to America's role in international trade. Not surprisingly, his study group will deal with this subject entitled Changing Technologies in the World Economy. Welcome, Bud Brown. <clears throat> Thank you, Dick. Dick, you could have gone on a long time without mentioning the fact that I ran for governor in Ohio in 1982. Uh, if I had gotten elected, I wouldn't have been the Deputy Secretary of Commerce. Obviously, in 1982, I did not get elected. Uh, I learned an old political lesson that's already been mentioned here uh, that year, and that is that timing is everything <laughs> in politics, sex, and humor. <clears throat> and I have to do a lot better in the latter two in order to make up for my bad timing in politics in 1982. I announced for that office the year that, or the, the quarter that the leading indicators went over the cliff economically. Uh, I got uh, filed for the office uh, in the quarter that the current indicators went over the cliff, and I was nominated in the quarter that the lagging indicators went over the cliff, and it was right straight down from there until election day when you have a Republican governor that you're trying to succeed, Dick, and. Uh, a uh, Republican president in office and you're running as the Republican candidate, that is not a real good year. Uh, the result is that I did not get elected and uh, I guess I have uh, uh, my father to blame for that because he ran for governor 50 years before that in 1932. Also not a real good economic year. <laughs> We don't learn a hell of a lot in my family from one generation to the next. Uh, as a matter of fact, when I was told I was to discuss why I got in politics, I, I guess that I have to in some way blame the fact that my father could not get the permission of his parents to get married before he was 21. Uh, as it turns out, what happened was that he got married the day after he was 21 and he was unemployed, and my grandfather, who had been for many, many years a uh, sort of community servant, uh, he and his sister uh, both, uh, she was the clerk of the Board of Education for 24 years, and she was the librarian and a lot of other things in our little town, and my grandfather had been the township clerk and the, and the treasurer of the village and a few things like that, and always a good Republican ward healer, if you will, and so I guess the reason that, that I got into politics was because of the, that kind of Boston background uh, where you are paid off for political loyalty because my desperate grandfather called up the Secretary of State who happened to come from our county and said, this guy just got married and I've got to have a job for him. I can't keep him and the new wife for the rest of our lives. So my dad was named a state statistician of Ohio at the age of 21. It was a job which has since been discontinued. <laughs> but he took advantage of his opportunity because two years later he was lieutenant governor of Ohio. He was 23 years old. He took his tin lizzie and campaigned all over Ohio for the primary against uh, five other candidates, all of whom were over 60, which was in seriously old age at that point. I learned it's not so bad anymore. Uh, <laughs> But that got him elected lieutenant governor with a Democratic governor, uh, James Cox. Uh, Cox, in 1920, two years later, was the Democratic nominee for president, and Warren Harding, the, state, the, the U.S. Senator from Ohio, was the Republican nominee. This gave my father another opportunity. He could have been Mike Kerb, I suppose, and uh, made trouble for Jim Cox, but he didn't. He operated responsibly. As a matter of fact, Cox uh, developed a case of pneumonia and there was considerable fear that he would die and that the lieutenant governor who would succeed to the office would not be constitutionally eligible to serve because he had to be 25 and he wasn't. <laughs> but <clears throat> Warren Harding conducted his campaign in Marion, Ohio, just about an hour and a half uh, drive uh, by that tin lizzie uh, away from Columbus in the fashion that McKinley had used 
20 years earlier, when he was a candidate for uh, the highest office in the land, he had a front porch campaign. And so the Republicans that came from all over the United States to greet Harding were in turn greeted by my dad, who got acquainted with the Republican hierarchy of the country. Well, that led to higher ambition. And in 1922, he ran for Secretary of State. Apparently, the guy from our county had retired, and he got defeated. He went back and started his own family newspaper business. And a couple of years later, ran for the Secretary of State again and won. Then he developed a serious problem, ethics. Uh, he was obliged as the Secretary of State to remove the election boards, Republican election boards, in Cleveland, Ohio, and in Youngstown, Ohio, for corruption. And he did. Uh, that made a reputation for him in the state as a fairly honest politician, uh, nonpartisan beyond that, uh, and he got uh, the opportunity to run for governor in 1932. I mentioned that earlier. Uh, and the real reason he got defeated in the primary was because he had removed those election boards. He thought his political career had ended in the depths of the Depression. Two years later, the Republicans asked him to run again. He did. Uh, he was nominated. And then he got defeated for the economic reasons that I mentioned earlier. Uh, the point of all this is that those accidents that happened in his career, I guess in some way have also happened in mine. But what influenced me through that process, uh, and he did some other things. He, in 36, he ran Frank Knox's campaign for uh, president. He didn't get the presidential nomination. He got the vice presidential nomination. And again, my dad toured the country with a candidate for the highest office in the land. In 1938, he knew that the center of politics was Columbus, Ohio, the state capital. And he wanted to run for governor for the third time. But there was somebody else who wanted to run for governor, and it was from his congressional district. Uh, and he hadn't run for governor. So the county chairman got together and said, all right, we know who should run. Our problem is, how are we going to tell Clarence it isn't him? They spent about three hours trying to decide, and they finally selected the person to tell him. And it was a banker who was the county chairman from one of the small counties whose bank held the notes on the old man's company. And he said, uh, Clarence, I think it's not your turn. Why don't you just go to the Congress? My dad did, thinking he'd be a one-term congressman and serve for 27 years. Well, I went to Washington with him at that time. He went from a very isolationist district in Ohio. There were parts of the country that were dead set against World War II and our participation in it until Pearl Harbor. Uh, and I can remember that heritage. Times have changed because Washington, of course, became the center of political activity in the country, and it wasn't longer the state capitals or the local communities. Uh, but I, through that time, lived and breathed politics with my family. I guess I didn't have any choice but to get into it, except it was very difficult for me to do it because uh, all the good jobs in my district were taken with my dad as the uh, congressman. I went in the newspaper business and served in that area for 17 years. So I know of some of Ed Fui's background, but the most exciting thing that happened to me was that our local small town team won the state championship one year. Uh, I wasn't in on any of those uh, other things that you were in on, Ed. Uh, but with that family political background, I learned also at my father's knee three basic lessons. Uh, I don't know how he went or what he went through to make that decision to remove those election boards, but I know that his whole political life must have passed in front of him at the time because one of the things he told me as I was growing up was always be able to look him in the eye and tell him to go to hell. Keep yourself independent enough to be, and be strong enough to make that decision. One of the ways you do that, he said, was to have your own business or profession so that you could have something to fall back on when politics failed you, or you failed politics for some reason or another. And finally, he said that you should try to always uh, do the best you can. And that was usually followed with, when I was your age, I was doing thus and so. 
Well, you can imagine for somebody whose father was 23 and the lieutenant governor of Ohio, that was quite a challenge. <laughs> I didn't get to be the lieutenant governor of Ohio at 23 or even the governor at, at a later age, but I decided that I would try to do as many things as I could early, and I went to the Harvard Business School and graduated when I was 21, uh, back a few years ago, uh, and went into service, which he had never been in, uh, and had a couple of experiences uh, in the Korean War uh, in battle. Uh, at 25, I bought my own weekly newspaper in order to be independent of the family business. Uh, and at 38, five years before he had done so, ran for Congress when he died and was elected. I served for 17 years. During that time, I had the opportunity to be active in uh, economic policy, in energy policy, but with the election of President Reagan, both of those things that I had worked on suddenly were not as much in the headlines as they had been, and certainly the leadership in the Congress was not where the leadership game was going to be played in those areas. It was now being played in the White House. And so that's what brought me to the decision to run for governor and leave the Congress. And finally, what brought me to the Department of Commerce. And in that role, I've had the opportunity to see the international changes that have occurred that now in some ways really move the decisions away even from our national capital. Because I'm convinced that uh, the guy who wrote One World when I was 13, the Republican candidate for president, Wendell Wilkie, was well before his time. He, wasn't, he didn't live in One World. He lived in a lot of nations at war. But we really are now in one world economically. If you have any question about that, just go back a few months to October 19th, when all the stock markets of the world collapsed literally on the same day, uh, perhaps sequentially, but one after another, they all reacted economically. We are being shaped very much by technology. The isolationist community from which uh, I came when I was a child to Washington cannot longer be isolationist. As a matter of fact, the biggest employer in my congressional district now is Honda of America, making cars and shipping them back now to Japan, along with some motorcycles that they're selling back to Japan. And we have a daughter who is working there as an engineer. We also are a modern family. We have a son who is an actor. Uh, you will see his movie come out February 12th with Sidney Poitier. Uh, uh, here called Shoot to Kill. I hope you'll all go out and see it. <clears throat> if you don't go, please buy the tape. He gets something out of that, too. <laughs> and finally, we have one playing football who, uh, if he hits it big in the uh, football career and plays in the pros, someone will take care of us in our old age. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Bud. Our next panelist is John H. Smith, who has been mayor of Pritchard, Alabama for the past seven years. He is the president of the National Conference of Black Mayors and secretary general of the World Conference of Mayors. He is also a Republican from Alabama. John Smith is uh, here with us to lead this fall, uh, this uh, spring, a study group entitled New Strategies for Planning and Managing Our Cities, the lead-off part of which will be how you can plan and manage Pritchard, Alabama, while you're in Cambridge, Massachusetts. John, <laughs> welcome. Thank you, Dick. Uh, and good evening. Good evening. <laughs> We are accustomed in Alabama to talking to our audiences, so when I say good evening, I'm just trying to find out if you're alive out there as an audience. So good evening. I'm extremely uh, delighted to, uh, to be here, and also I, I consider it an honor to have been selected to participate in what I consider uh, an opportunity for, for not only me to challenge myself, but also to use it as an opportunity to challenge you as students and to challenge this institute as well. Uh, I was um, 
uh, interested in the, in the reception that the, that the students had for me. Uh, I, I had a, an opportunity to meet with the students on the selection, and I think we had an opportunity to discuss a range of different ideas. And, and when I first came here, you know, although I'm a product of a campus and spent a good part of my own life on a campus before becoming an elected official, and most of my own perceptions, my personal perceptions, of, and what I believe now as a, as a political leader, were shaped uh, to a large degree by my experiences on a campus similar to what, uh, what uh, you're going through now. And in my discussions, and because I have not had a, a, a lot of interactions with students, I didn't know really what the pulse of the campus was today. And I've been quite curious as to what students are thinking today, what, what are your ambitions uh, about the future, uh, how do you read and how do, how do you view the future. And I, was, <clears throat> I, I left here with a, a bit of enthusiasm after the meetings that I had with the, with the students here. I, I feel that the atmosphere on, on, on this campus and, and I believe on some of the things I've been reading from my own campus at Wisconsin has a lot of the same uh, feelings that occurred during the time that I was there during the 60s. There's, a, there's, a, there's about to be some kind of a explosion of new ideas and new information. At least I hope so. And the reason that I hope so is because I've spent the last eight years in uh, what the Economic Development Administration has characterized as the third most distressed community of its size in the United States. And after uh, the eight uh, years of experience, while I have not, uh, have not dampened my enthusiasm for, I think, a new possibility and a new direction for being able to solve problems or people and rebuild organization, uh, I walked away from uh, uh, this situation to come here because there is a great need now for new information and new talent to be able to solve uh, the problems that, uh, that we're up against as mayors. I think one of the most important jobs in the United States today is really managing a, a local community in the sense that that local community is where the end product of policy, uh, within users of policy. We also the place in which uh, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the effect or at least the, uh, the outcome of that policy, the effectiveness of that policy can be, can be measured directly. And I think uh, the success of the, uh, the United States, the success of you as potential leaders, as governors, as, uh, as uh, teachers, uh, as technicians in the United States, in large part will be measured by uh, what impact you, uh, you will have uh, directly or indirectly on places like the city of Pritchard. <clears throat> now, places like Pritchard are far away from Harvard. But they come, uh, 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 they are brought very close uh, to this campus in the sense that uh, once you leave here and you begin to influence directly the policies of the U.S. government or some state that you reside in or various other types of uh, professional institutions. And uh, to some large degree, our communities are, are, are somewhat secondary to, 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 uh, to some of the solutions that may be generated here. And it, it, again, it brings to, uh, to, uh, to focus my real reasons for wanting to be at Harvard and for wanting to engage you in this challenge that, that, that I'm sharing with you. Uh, my personal perspective, uh, uh, starting at, uh, at Wisconsin as a, as a student, uh, both as an undergraduate and a graduate student, started with, uh, with attempting to run for uh, a student government chair. I ran for, uh, for student government uh, president and lost. And I guess the real lesson in that uh, was that being most popular is really not what wins the election, I guess, in that instance. It was uh, having the uh, experience of having sold beer in the, uh, in the student rat scaler. At least that's who won the election, the guy who uh, had, had, that, had that experience. <coughs> I walked away from the, that, that experience, though, and after spending some time at Wisconsin, examining in detail, and it, it was a good time to, to be on campus during the 60s because as a uh, young student, we had the opportunity to challenge most of everything, how the campus was organized, how society was organized, <clears throat> what were the policies for, for, for the world that we saw uh, unfolding in front of us, to be both uh, creative and destructive in, uh, in, uh, in many instances. It was a good time to, uh, to be a young person on campus if you maintained your perspective. Uh, I carried most of the views and most of the ideas that I had uh, generated on campus in this belief that I could make a contribution to my own community and that indeed my own community needed me uh, more so than uh, me, my presence in Madison, Wisconsin. And I, I, I left uh, Wisconsin uh, January of 80, uh, the 3rd of January of 80, of 80 to be very precise, to take a position as the field operations supervisor. That's the, the advice that the politician gave me in the area that I should come and incubate for a while. And uh, I, I took that position January of 80. 
uh, in March of that same year, I resigned to run for mayor. In July, I was elected mayor. What, uh, what happened is, uh, one, and I used to share, again, my, my own personal perspectives, I think I was able to, to, uh, to, to galvanize a vote for, for one reason. It was my hometown and my, I still had family there. But I think for a second reason, it has to do with my belief in, uh, in philosophy of politics. One, uh, I started with uh, uh, allowing people to participate in their own government. Uh, I, uh, I, I walked and I talked to people, did a lot of walking and talking, and so the idea that uh, in order for us to have an effective government, you must participate in it. I'm just simply a leader. I bring some skills, and I'm willing to loan my name and the name of my family in order for us to begin to try to rebuild this government in, in a way that I have some hope for it in some way that you have some hope for it. So I believe, first of all, that people must participate in government. If people re refuse and uh, fail to participate in government, then our concept of a government, as we've imagined it, uh, does not work. The second uh, concept, and it has to do again with the environment that we, we, we're operating in, is that I believe very strongly that uh, in economic self-reliance, uh, uh, I uh, represent and uh, managing a community that is, uh, has emerged to be a, a nothing less than what I call a federal plantation. Uh, it, has, uh, it has eroded uh, to the point that uh, the self-reliance in it, the self-regulation in it, the, the self-direction in it, the self-management in it has been removed. Uh, that is dangerous as far as I'm concerned, where people don't have real control over their own lives and uh, being able to leverage some direct influence over their own lives. So my belief in economic self-reliance is very strong. The third thing that I, I believe in is being an, an official of a local government is something that is absent, is this concept of a, of a municipalism. People tend to have lost this sense of a boundary. And, uh, and when we lose this sense of a boundary, is you, you lose a sense of your own household, there's a sense of not to take care of it, to, uh, to look forward to it, or to project uh, any, any new, uh, new concepts for it. So I projected also this notion within our own community, this idea of municipalism, a belief in your own community, to promote your own community, to believe in it, to try to create new possibilities for it. And I guess in, in, in terms of a personal perspective, and I think uh, as a priority, I feel that uh, one of the greatest things that uh, any of us could do and one of the things I've uh, spent most of my time is looking uh, to ways in which we can protect the future of the municipality. That is, uh, very young children and women with dependent children. Uh, Forty percent of the families in my own community are headed by women with dependent children. Uh, it's a, uh, a crime, as far as I'm concerned, the, the uh, almost non-existing way in which we don't protect the interests of our own future, the, the future of our own institutions, the future students at Harvard uh, who n never even get an opportunity primarily because the laws of our, of our, of our, of our states and the, and the laws of our own national government does not to protect the interests of, uh, of, uh, of uh, people who cannot fend for themselves. Uh, you and I today, as I argued before some of the uh, congressional uh, hearings or whenever I get an opportunity, you and I would probably today spend more time before some, uh, some federal administrative system if we uh, uh, killed an eagle or a seal, if we would if we abused the child today. I think that that is a, a distorted uh, priority. And so because of that, I've spent most of my time emphasizing just that in order to preserve the future of my own community. And also, I guess bring to a focus one of the other things that I've realized by having a, a university uh, background and a university experience is the, uh, the enormous uh, capacity of the use of science and scientific technology in solving problems immediately. Uh, I don't think that there's any way that uh, problems of distress, problems of organizational design, and the problems of human development can be solved today uh, in places like Pritchard, Alabama, and many other places throughout the United States that are represented by the, uh, the Union of the National Conference of Black Mayors, unless we can bring into focus or uh, develop an interest on the part of uh, this uh, Institute on Politics, the larger Harvard community, and the larger um, uh, university systems throughout the United States, unless there's an active interest on the part of those institutions to be able to, uh, to, uh, to take an active part, uh, primarily on, among people like yourselves, who see yourselves as uh, new visionaries of the world, uh, new leaders, to be able to carve out new possibilities and take a pride in being able to solve problems of distress and take that on as a technical challenge or a management challenge or a scientific challenge. I don't see uh, any way, again, and I'm speaking as, uh, as a person who resided uh, in, a, in, 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 uh, in a community that needs that type of focus and need that type of orientation. 
And it is my hope that uh, as, a, as a fellow here, that again, I can challenge you, that I can challenge myself, challenge this large uh, university community, and uh, challenge, uh, in, we set a pace and an example as to what uh, uh, the new president, uh, the new governors, the new senators, and the new political bodies ought to be think of, thinking about with respect to, uh, to setting a pace uh, for new opportunities for people. And I look forward to working with all of you in, uh, in meeting that challenge. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Smith. I, in the spirit of full disclosure, uh, I, as a former governor of Pennsylvania, I have to tell you that John Smith also at one time was a running back for the Philadelphia Eagles. So, <laughs> <laughs> Geraldine Ferraro was the first woman ever to run for vice president on a major party ticket. Can I stop there? <laughs> After a distinguished service in the United States House of Representatives in 1984, she had that unique experience given to so few in this political system of ours of traveling this nation from coast to coast and border to border as a candidate for the second highest office in the land. She also was a practicing attorney and served as a, as a prosecuting attorney in New York City. And she is here to join us as a fellow when she will be addressing in her study group a question that I hope is relevant to every one of you. So you want to be the president. Jerry. Thank you. Thank you, Jake. I, I am delighted to be here this evening. I'm delighted to participate in the program, but I must tell you I'm just a little bit disappointed. I really wish Marvin Kalb had invited me to his series. <laughs> I tell you, I have learned a lot tonight. I didn't know that John Smith was a Republican. I didn't know that Harriet was part Norwegian. <laughs> I didn't know that Ed couldn't hold a job. <laughs> but I found out the most incredible thing. You know, Bud and I were colleagues in the House. I found out that we had both this incredible sixth sense of political timing. See, when he ran for governor in 1982, the economic indicators we're going over the side for the Republicans. When I ran in 1984, the political indicators were going, economic indicators were going up for the Republicans. So we both did very, very well in uh, choosing our years to run. Uh, let me just spend a little time going back over how I got involved in politics, and let me suggest to you that you don't do it the same way. Uh, I started, I guess, as part of a midlife career ch change, um, perhaps as a result of midlife crisis, I don't know. Uh, but when I was um, your age, when I was in law school, I was teaching during the day and attending law school at night and decided as a young lawyer from Queens, especially someone who was an Italian-American Catholic going to an evening law school, uh, that the way you got a job when you got out of law school was uh, by being political, at least in Queens County at least up until about two years ago in Queens County. Uh, but uh, in any event, so I did all the things uh, that people did. I went and licked stamps, and, uh, and then I saw the quality of candidates who were running and decided that uh, I moved to a different county. I uh, got married in 1960, took the bar exam two days before my marriage, passed it. Um, went to live in Manhattan, and it was like being in a different world, though, for those of you who are from outside New York, Queens is part of New York City. Um, lived in Manhattan, joined a Democratic club, again wanted to become active because I was going to eventually work as a lawyer. I ran uh, for office. My first run was not Congress. I'm sharing that with you for probably the first time publicly. I ran in two different places on the ticket. I ran as Geraldine Zakara, which was my married name. I ran under my married name because I was eight months pregnant and because in 1960 you weren't walking around eight months pregnant unless you had a married name. And I won. I won as a delegate to the Judicial Conference and I won as a state committee woman, had a baby a month later and that was the end of my political career. Um, I stayed home and raised my children. I have three. 
Uh, I have an extremely good sense of timing. Donna was here at the business school until last year. And my youngest is that Brown was here and would have been available for her mother to take her out to dinner, except that she went away for this semester to Europe when she heard I was coming up. Um, <laughs> in any event, I stayed home until about 1973 and a half and found out that my cousin was running for district attorney of Queens County, and all of a sudden I became politically active once again. I ran teas, I ran around giving out papers and all the rest of that stuff, and then went and after the election was finished said, could I have a job? Um, my cousin was very worried about being accused of nepotism, and so he made me go before a, a committee, which was headed by another Queenside, a friend of mine, whom some of you may know is Mario Cuomo now, governor of New York. He was Mario Cuomo then, too, but he wasn't quite as important. <laughs> In any event, we went through the process. I became assistant DA. My cousin got fed up with the job. He left and became a Supreme Court judge. And someone else came into office whose name is John Santucci, for whom I worked uh, for three years. I started a bureau when I was in the DA's office called Special Victims Bureau. I was a bureau chief, which means I was one of the big honchos there. There were about seven of us. Um, I had, I got paid less than everybody else. No such thing as equal pay for equal work at that time. And when I complained about it, I was told, but Jerry, you have a husband. Oh, couldn't get away with that now. Oh. In any event, he got away with it then. And I stayed around and ran this bureau which we created. And it was called the Special Victims Bureau because our victims were very special. Uh, we handled all the sex crimes in the county. We handled all the referrals from family court on child abuse. We handled um, battered spouse legislation had just been passed in New York in 1977. We implemented it. And we also handled all the violent crimes against senior citizens. Uh, as you can imagine, by the end of several months of dealing with this type of victim, you become a little bit of a basket case if you care about people, if you really do care about people. It became time for me to move, or it came time for me to move. Um, and again, I wanted out so I needed a job. Where did I look to politics? Um, I would have run for anything that was available. I would have run for city council. I would have run for the assembly. I would have run for the state senate. Um, I was coming home from a bar mitzvah. Uh, Charles, a neighbor's son got bar mitzvah, and my husband was home sick. And I got a ride home again from Mario Cuomo, who suggested to me, wanted to run for Congress. I thought he was nuts. I mean, he was a man who had lost two elections, uh, and giving me advice on what to do politically was not really what I thought <laughs> the best source for me. But in any event, I sat around and thought about it. The person who was the incumbent was Jim Delaney. You know, I'm sure many of you don't know who he is. Most of you probably don't. In fact, most of the people in his district didn't know who he was either, but that's okay. Jim Delaney had been a member of Congress for about 35 years. He was chairman of the Rules Committee, very, very powerful, and there was no way I was going to challenge him. So I sat back. God must have whispered in his ear because he decided to retire, and I then ran for uh, Congress. I was not the candidate of the party. I ran against the party. My opponent eventually was a right-winger who was an assemblyman, my current assemblyman, who used to go up and down the uh, the streets screaming about um, the issue of abortion, among other things, and, and various other matters. Eh, a little strange, man. What can I tell you? But in any event, I worked hard. We worked from um, from April one. I quit my job I'm in March. Worked from April one until election day, 16, 18 hours a day. It was great for the figure. I lost a lot of weight, uh, and I won, which was the biggest shock of all. My district. Some of you may know. I said, well, has anybody here seen All in the Family? <laughs> okay, if you've seen All in the Family, you've seen my district. The lead-in is filmed in my district. In fact, let me just stop myself for, for a minute to tell you a story. Um, my constituents are really, I mean, they're not Archies, but close. Um, I've been asked on several occasions how they ever elected me. I used to say they didn't, Edith did. But we had... <laughs> But there are male and female Ediths in that district, I have to tell you, not just female Ediths. During the 83 period of time when everybody was talking about me as being a candidate for vice president, one of the daily newspapers said, can we go take a picture of you by the house that's in the 
film by Archie Sass. And I said, sure, but I don't know who lives there. And they said, oh, well, let's go anyway. We'll knock on the door. We go to the door. You know, the cameras. And, bangs her, and a woman comes to the door. But she doesn't come out. She comes to the screen. And she said, yes. And I said, I'm Geraldine Ferrari, You're a member of Congress. Um, I'd like to speak to you. We have some people here who'd like to speak to you as well from the press. So she says, wait a minute. And she sends her husband out. Um, he comes out. He's in his 70s, lacking a few teeth. And I tell you, it was a caricature. It was, it was beautiful. I mean, he was a retired federal employee and, you know, very tough. He comes down, he sits on the step, and we're chit-chatting around. He says to her, come on out. And I look up at her, she's got her hair in rollers. <laughs> and my reaction was, oh, God, I don't want to embarrass her. You know, let's take a picture of her like that, and it'll be a laugh. So I said, don't come out. Go get your hair out of rollers before you come out, and then come out, and we'll take a picture. They come out, and I, I felt badly. These are people I don't know. I mean, they live in my district, and they're there with the camera, and I was so worried about what the press was going to say. The press was going to say. Um, and I, I said to him, you know, these are very nice people. I said, they live in my district. I said, you know, you may think because they live in Archie Bunker's house that they're conservative Republicans, but they're liberal Democrats. And the man turned around to me and said, Geraldine, you could say what you want, but it's not true. <laughs> In any event, that was my district. And when I went to Congress, I must tell you, I went like every other member of Congress. I went terrified about what was going to happen in the next election. I worried about every vote. If I had been able to put every single vote on a machine and poll my district on it, I would have been very, very happy because it made me worry that I was a little bit, a little bit more liberal than they and I was going to be defeated in my next re-election. I let that worry me for about six months. And then because I wasn't sleeping, I decided that that was a dumb way to handle my job. And I decided that what I was going to do was I was going to do, I was going to do all the constituent stuff. I was going to go back. I was going to have town hall meetings where I let them yell at me. But I was going to vote the way I felt was right for me and for my community and for my country. And I figured if I was down there, I knew a little bit more about what was going on than they did. And so that's how I... Uh, continued in my time in Congress. I ended up serving on the Budget Committee, uh, Public Works and Transportation, aging because I had a very elderly community and I did want to get reelected, um, and on Post Office and Civil Service, and that was strictly political too. I had an area that needed a zip code change, and the way you do it is you get on a committee and you say to the Post Master General, come in and see me, and he comes in and sees you, he gives you a zip code change, and people vote for you, so it worked. But in any event, I lasted in Congress for six years. And I say lasted in Congress because I don't know had lightning not struck in the shape of John Riley in a hotel room on a Tuesday night in July of 1984, how much longer I would have stayed. Being in Congress is an incredible experience. Um, I am one of those people who is in love with politics. And I guess because it came late in life. I want, and one of the things I want this course to do, the, this study group that we're doing, I want to get you involved early in life. I missed out for 42 years on having a say in what was going on in this country. And I got down to Congress and met the most incredible group of people on both sides of the aisle. I am impressed by how much they know um, how hard they work, how little they're paid, and the fact that they accomplish a tremendous amount in a country that is very, very diverse. I think over the last seven years, we have seen that you can get into politics without being very smart. Um, <laughs> And after having another career uh, in which you may not have been the best, um, perhaps not winning any awards, but let me say to you one thing, and this I say seriously, that this country is strong enough to allow that to happen, but how much better will it be when you are in that position of taking control of this country? in the presidency or the vice presidency or wherever in the Congress and the Senate. 
and really knowing what the hell you're talking about, which will be a delight, and really caring about what goes on. So that's my advice to you is, is don't wait as I did until you're too old. And don't start off as I did as a cynic, believing that the only reason you get involved in politics is to get a job. Uh, there are other reasons to get involved politically. Politicians are doers. It is an honorable profession, I just want you all to know. And it is something that I hope that after the four months of meeting and talking to the two losers over here, <laughs> but me, that maybe, um, maybe we'll convince you that you know you got to run. In fact, if you think back to the chariot of fires uh, conversation, remember when Abraham was talking to his wife, he turned around and he said to her, I, I don't want to run. And she said, if you don't run, you don't win. And then he said, well, he said, you know, what happens if I lose? She said, if you lose, you run again. The athletic prowess in that movie was by the man. The political wisdom was from a woman. <laughs> Thank you, Jerry. Thanks, Jerry. It's a pleasure to have you here. The American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees established the Jerry Wirth Fellowship at the John F. Kennedy School of Government to bring outstanding labor leaders from abroad here to share their experiences and views and important labor management issues in this country and the Institute of Politics is pleased and proud to have with us this semester Heinz Klunker, who is the Jerry Wirth Fellow uh, here at Harvard. He comes to us from West Germany. He is the former president of the Public Services and Transport Workers Union in Stuttgart. But perhaps of more importance is the fact that he has served worldwide as a bridge between labor unions, businesses, and government over an extended period of time. He's also had the unique experience as serving on the boards of directors of Lufthansa Airlines and Weber, the largest West German company in energy and chemicals, as a union representative. So he brings a unique background to his service as a Jerry Worth Fellow Heinz Klunker, welcome to the Forum at the Institute of Politics. First of all, I'd like to thank you to give me the opportunity to be with you while you study here. I'd like to learn from you about your political system, about the university structure, and I may as well pick up some knowledge in English so I can talk to you. My life did not start in the neighborhood of rich people or high-ranking Politician. I was born in 1925. My father was a skilled worker. My mother worked in a cleanery business as a uh, unskilled worker, and they both got unemployed when I was four years old. My family got unemployed on the economic recession by the end of the 20s, and my family had to remain, for political reason, a couple more years after Hitler took over his dirty regime. And I may use the opportunity to give you a little bit information about how people feel to grow up in a different society, in the danger to be in between what you feel without any experience about political structures, 
what older people feel. And as a young man, without the generation gap, you may got the impression that the majority of the people cannot make mistakes political-wise. And your parents are probably wrong. And I was eight years of age when Hitler took over. I was 14 years of age when the Second World War began. And as a young man, in my age, I was between my parents' feeling and thinking, my own guesses and feelings, and what the majority of the population was feeling that time. So every Saturday, we did not have to go to school after 1937. We had to attend a course of pre-military training instead of going to school, get uniforms. My parents didn't like it, and they got in touch with a bakery. And I had to deliver in, on Saturday morning, with the permission of my parents, rolls, donuts, cookies, and bread to the household. And that provided me for being in uniform and do pre-military service, kind of baloney as 11-year-old boy. So, but I feel sorry about it, about the position of my parents, because I couldn't understand why they kept me away from other young people to be around, to go to boys camps. But later on, I learned why. So then, in 1943, I got forced to go into the army as a draft person. And this wasn't a good experience, probably, as you enjoy to have. Not because I was rank and file, or whatever you name it, not an officer, not with a possibility with, with the background of my family to become in charge, but doing within Prussian tradition what they want me to do, not to think, to act as a tool, as a machinery in this dictatorship regime with military thinking and the old Prussian tradition. When I learned as an 18 year old soldier before being sent to the West, it was in May, that my mother told me she was in trouble with the Gestapo. And now it began in me a big fight. Why do I do not believe what a majority of the people believes? Why do I stick to my parents? What wrong did they to society, to the state, that my mother got tortured by Gestapo? And I made a decision. This was the first time I had to make a political decision. And my political decision was after my mother cried and told me what happened with her in the basement of the Gestapo building. I said, I'm going to run away from the German army as soon as I can. Or I take my guns, get into the Gestapo headquarters, and kill some of them. But then my when I told my parents that I intend to do so, my mother got me in her arms and said, don't do it, run away. They will kill you before you even get one bullet out of your gun. So I was sent to Western France, and I was lucky. D-Day began in the night from the 5th to 6th of June that the Americans came with parachutes, with boats, 
And I was at the first position an American soldier unit put their feet on, my parachute, and from the seaside. And on the 7th of June, it means two days later, I was on my way to England. With the risk that if some of the officers or some of my comrades were seeing what I was doing, running away from the unit, they would shoot me right away without a trial. But I took the risk because I didn't see any reason to fight against American troops, British troops, or French illegal troops, because I got the feeling from my parents that they, they come to deliver my people because the Germans that time weren't smart enough to do it themselves. Only a couple of people fought against Hitler by using weapons on the 20th July 1944. I was brought over to England and from England to Boston one night and from Boston in a train to Alabama. <laughs> I didn't happen to be in your town and I had to go in the swamps and jungle and saw wood by the hand, not with a mature machine. And uh, a couple of weeks later, I had some problems with officers coming after me. I tell you, some of you American army officers were not intelligent enough to find out that there was a fascist Nazi activity in prison camps in the United States. They even hanged people, and I got beaten from some of the officers who came after me while I said the war is over. Not only for me and you, the war is lost. Take the number of tanks you saw on the way. Take the number of ships. And the idea is a message we should learn. And this was my first contact with a democratic society in my life as a grown-up. And this was my first political position. I was elected, like you, as the speaker of my fellow prisoners. And I was very proud because this was the first time in my life I knew what an election is going to be. And the regime I came from, there was no any election. There was army order, party order, and so on. So, and behind prison camps, I took every minute, I worked in an American officer's club, I took every minute to learn what is freedom. I couldn't believe that you can read a newspaper and even reading the foolish announcement of the German Supreme Command, <laughs> what they brought about during the war, about their point of view about warfare. In the front page of your New York Times that time, you, you, you got the Allied Command report, and two sentences later, you got the, the lazy Nazi propaganda, what they brought about the world, how the situation of the world is continuing. I'm, I will make it short. <laughs> Someone told me once when I had a political meeting, kiss, and I didn't know what it meant. I thought someone is going to kiss me, but they meant, keep it short, stupid. <laughs> <laughs> so, this lessons I learned pretty quick. And when I got back from prison camp, I intended to go on immigration ward to your country. And I got a registered number. I was 21 years of age that time when I got back after the two-year prison term in your country. And then the friends of my family came and said, you stay here. We need you with your, old, uh, with your age to get in touch with young people and tell them what you learned in, in the United States, even while you were 
behind prison. We need your generation to rebuild a democratic society in Germany. And I was very proud, my first political position was in 1946, I was elected in the workers' community as a full-time official for the Social Democratic Party with 21 years of age. And I was very proud, and I told it to my grandmother. She, she became a member of the Social Democratic Party before 1900, and it meant something. And she said, I was very proud to tell her what happened on that party conference. And she said, son, she, she named me son, uh, I say, Grandmother, I'm very proud. Stop, she said. If you ever take one mark out of labor's or party money and you're not supposed to, I'm going to use this knife and kill you. <laughs> <laughs> and I never forget the type she expressed about morale in political life. And it was a hard time. And it was a hard decision for me. As you can see, I love eating. <laughs> and what with the experience in an American officers club in Florida about the food and coming back to Germany in 1946-7 as a policeman, hungry or a party official, hungry as hell every day. But I made the decision and I worked hard and then I got a scholarship from the labor movement in Germany to study social sciences in Hamburg. And when I came back, I was elected in union uh, official service. I served 25 years as an elected officer on the national level of my executive board, the second largest union in Germany. I the most time I spent time on the bargaining table for collective bargaining on the national level, as we do it. And my first counterpart was calling me names at the, at the first meeting, and I said, never forget, crooks do not cheat each other. So that was this, after he calling me names. <laughs> and we became friends. He was on the bargaining table on this side, I on this side, to pay respect to the workers' interests. And in, uh, when I became president of my union, I was 39, of that second largest public sector uh, union in the Federation of All Unions in Germany. And I'm very proud, an American union leader nominated me in 1973 as the world president for an affiliation of union in the public sector and was supported by one of the important union leaders from Israel. If you can imagine what it means for a former German soldier mm. to get nominated from a democratic person like Jerry Wolf, supported by Victor Gottbaum, New York, and supported by union people from Israel. It made me very, very proud. And I remained till I had to give up for health reasons. But I'm still on the board on the international field and I pay attention to human rights. I'm working with Amnesty International. I went to prison camps in Turkey when Turkish union leader got into prison after the military takeover in 80. I went to Spain when I had the opportunity and I felt the Germans are in response because they've been sending once war planes to get rid of democracy in Spain as an assistant from the German fascist system. I felt in response to give a little bit of help to the Spanish labor union after they are on their way to create a democratic structure of state and government. And I've been in, in touch with people in Chile, 
in South Africa on the world level. I'm doing on human rights and I fight for peace. I started East-West relationship uh, with the labor movement and uh, but I am not a theoretical oriented man. I'm a pre I did the practical bargaining and bargain with not democratic governments to release prisoners out of their cells on the world level. So, and I'm so proud to be with you and forgive me, I have to begin to learn your language better than I do now. I hope it is enough to change my experience, but I love to learn and discuss with you your daily problems and general fundamental issues about peace, social justice, and the fight against unemployment. Thank you for this. Thank you, Heinz Klunker. I can only say that uh, your English is better than our German. Of that, I'm, of that I am supremely confident. I think you can tell from hearing our panel this evening how excited we are about having people here with such a rich variety of experiences and how much we look forward to the opportunity through their study groups to share those experiences with as large a group as possible. We have some time. I know many of you, the hour is getting late, but I think uh, it would be worthwhile if there are questions that... Uh, our desire to be asked of our fellows uh, on the panel this evening. There are microphones around the hall. If you'll move to the microphone, make your question short, make it a question, and so we can get as many uh, folks the opportunity to speak as possible. Yes, we'll start here. Yes, I, I'm very excited this year because we're going to be getting a new president. And um, we've been very fortunate to have um, all, almost all the presidential candidates here except for George Bush. Um, at the same time, I'm having a little trouble getting enthused about any of them. And um, so my question, therefore, is um, to anyone, but particularly Geraldine Ferraro, I'm, I'm curious about. And, and um, I'd like to know, um, who do you prefer for president and why? <laughs> I would love to share that with you when the time comes for me to share that with others as well. Uh, I'm, I ha have not chosen a candidate yet, and it's not because I'm not enthused. Obviously, it will be a, a Democrat, right? I mean, that we know, all right? But... I'm not, it's not because I'm not enthused. It's, it's uh, for several reasons. One is that I think, um, I think it's, it's, I, okay, we're all right. I think what we have to do is, first of all, let some of the voters make their voices heard. And I think that we have to wait to see what happens in Iowa and in New Hampshire. Uh, the fact that you're not enthused is probably because you don't really know the candidates yet. Um, you've been seeing them in, in debates on television. You see very little difference between the Democrats, very little difference between all of the Republicans. Give them time. After Iowa, you're going to see two or three emerge. Um, you're going to see everybody get enthused, including the press. And, uh, and you will find eventually a candidate that you can look to. We have excellent candidates, and I'll say this on both sides of the aisle, both parties. Um, I think it's going to be a very exciting year. I think you have uh, people who have a tremendous amount of experience in uh, national office and federal office um, in both parties. You have, in the Democratic Party, of course, you have Governor Dukakis, who has had a tremendous amount of experience in management, managing a state of this size. Um, you have people who have, have been around politics a long time, people who understand politics, people who will be able to articulate uh, the issues extremely well and are articulating the issues already. Give them time and just give yourself another month and become enthusiastic because it's young people who have to get out and make their voices heard. The issues that are facing this country today are issues that are going to affect not only you folks, but your children and your grandchildren. The budget deficit is something that has to be addressed. It was something we talked about in 1980. Remember President Reagan used to say 19... No, you don't remember. 1980, some of you do. 
But President Reagan in 1980 said, 1983, I'm going to balance the budget. In 1984, I'm going to have a $93 billion surplus. Wow, he's only a quarter of a trillion dollars off. <laughs> uh, you have to take a close look at that. We said the same thing in 1984. Please, please think about that deficit in the 1988 elections when you go to vote. Make sure that you pick the person. I would prefer that you pick the Democrat, but pick the person whom you really believe is going to do something about the future of this country economically for you and your children. And if you think about that, then you're thinking about the future of the world as well. So wait a while. Get enthusiastic in any minute now. But get enthusiastic, and the time will come. And stay tuned. Jerry Ferrara will be here after the Iowa caucuses, the New Hampshire primaries, after Super Tuesday. And I think you'll hear that question again. <laughs> yes, indeed. Uh, question, for, is this for, question for Andrew, Andrew Michelle. Uh, you're, you're going to be leading a, a seminar on black leadership. Could you comment on the Jackson candidacy? Um, what do you think of his leadership of black America? He's certainly the most high-profile leader, but perhaps tell us um, some other black leaders we should be looking at right now or considering, and what might be the disadvantage of his kind of galvanizing all the attention um, as one sort of solo artist? Um, black politician. First of all, I think it's very important uh, that Jesse Jackson is in the race. Uh, and I support uh, him uh, financially uh, because, as Roger Wilkins said on the Today Show the other day, with Jesse in the race, everyone has left the issues of social justice to Jesse. What is going to happen, I suspect, is that he is going to garner enough delegates that when he gets to the convention, he is going to force whomever the candidate is going to be, to deal with those questions. And we can talk about the budget deficit, but if we're going to talk about the welfare of this country, we cannot write off a generation of people or a group of people who will be welfare dependent. We cannot do that. And Jesse's going to make sure that does not happen. It gets included in the As for um, his leadership and his role in the black community, uh, that's what my seminar is going to be about. Uh, Unfortunately, uh, and it's 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 in the it's in the description of my uh, of my course. Uh, there's some assumption that uh, you know Jesse or somebody else is going to uh, step into Martin Luther King's shoes. Uh, we have matured as a black community, and therefore we are not monolithic. And the likelihood that there will be a single voice uh, that will be able nationally to uh, speak for the entire black community is very slim. I suspect. Uh, right here in the Kennedy School, you have a professor on the faculty who has a very different perspective uh, about uh, black folks than I do. Uh, he's entitled to his perspective, and I'm entitled to mine. But the point is, that's legitimate. I mean, those different perspectives are all legitimate, in my view. And we cannot expect or force 20-plus million people uh, to speak with one voice. What we do need, though, and I think the entire uh, uh, the United States needs this, but certainly the black community needs this, is some method of involving younger people so that they are prepared for leadership. And that's where we have all fallen down on the job. Uh, so I want to look at, in this study group, who are the people out there? What are the forces that are bringing them, uh, them to the fore? But right now, considering what's going on among poor people in this country, I say thank God for Jesse Jackson and to keep those issues on the Democratic agenda. Um, yes, this is to Michelle or or anyone. Um, do you think that the system for primaries needs to be changed um, due to the fact that the first primaries are in um, Iowa and New Hampshire and there's very little black um, communities in both those areas? Do you think that we should work towards changing our system somewhat or do you think that it, it all works out with Super Tuesday? Or do you have any comment on you know, I, that, to, to change it because there's no uh, large black populations in Iowa and New Hampshire is the wrong reason to change it. And I'd like Ed or Geraldine to speak on that. Actually, Ed is the expert on priorities. Let me just tell you that in 1982, I was a member of the Hunt Commission, which tried to, tried to eliminate um, both the Iowa and New Hampshire as starting off the whole season. We tried to lump everybody into four months. Uh, we kind of succeeded, except with those two states who threatened, I think, to secede from the union if we if we allowed that to happen. These are economically big big deals for each of those states, and so it was virtually impossible to do. But we did tighten the primary season. Um, Ed can really talk a little bit more about about the the technicalities of primaries, but we did try to uh, 
try to do a little bit better job of shortening the system, and we didn't totally succeed. I don't think that, uh, that Iowa and New Hampshire taken together are a bad place to start, leaving aside this matter that you've already raised, which is a, a, a major caveat. But uh, you ha A, you have to start somewhere. B, you, I think it's a good idea that we start in states that are so small that a can any candidate can run. He, he or she does not have to have a lot of resources. But that candidate has to have a message that they can send, in the words of a former Institute of Politics fellow, um, uh, Mark Shields, in a retail fashion, one voter at a time, from door to door, uh, and, and, and get support uh, in, a, in a small state. Taken together, Iowa and New Hampshire people take their vote very seriously. A lot of them participate. It's a complicated system in Iowa. It's a simple one in New Hampshire. Um, the two states are quite different in, um, in their economic condition at the moment. I think you can arguably say that Iowa is one of the most depressed with an agricultural-based economy, and New Hampshire is one of the most prosperous, by some measurements, the most prosperous state in the country with a high-tech economy. Neither one is as rural as it used to be. They both have the majority of the people live in medium-sized cities, as do most Americans. I think uh, taken together, as I said, is, it's, it's not a bad place to start. Maybe we ought to rotate it somehow, but the Hunt Commission looked at things like that and couldn't come up with a solution, but I hope that it always stays. The first states will be the small states, and bear in mind, I think we, all of you who are students of American politics know this, but um, since 1952, no president of the United States has been elected who didn't first win the New Hampshire primary. Uh, Ms. Ferraro, you urge people here, young people, to get into politics, you say it's really a good thing to do and that, that um, you're glad about your experience, but it seems to me that some of the best people aren't getting into it. I'm thinking of Patricia Schroeder and Mayor Cuomo and perhaps a lot of other good people who don't want to play the game that you have to play and that you've been hurt by yourself. And I, I, I'm glad to hear that you still think it's a good Thing to be in, but I, I'm cynical and skeptical. I Don't be. Like, if you take a look at why Governor Cuomo isn't in, I've known Mario a long time. He's serious when he says this is not when he wants to do it. It's not now. I mean, he is the governor of, of New York State. Uh, you know, it's a, it's not exactly a small job, and he's he really does want to do that job well. He just feels this is not the time for himself and for his family to move. But that doesn't mean that uh, that he thinks it's anything less of the presidency or or uh, have any less of a commitment to this country and to the entire political system. As far as Pat Schroeder, Pat Schroeder said the reason she didn't stay in was because she felt she was getting in late and because Pat felt that she couldn't do the job of being a member of Congress. It, it's a, it is a seven-day-a-week job. It is a, I mean, she had a real dedication to her constituents. She had trouble in her head saying, I'll go out and campaign in Iowa as you have to do for 100 days and miss lots of votes. I can't do that. And she said it to herself, I can't do it the right way. And I certainly, as a woman, I'm not going to do it ha in, in a way that is, <laughs> you'll forgive me, I almost did it, in a way that was not totally uh, right because she didn't want to be criticized, at, I think, even more strongly as a woman if she had not, as she had done it, not fully. So it, it, there are reasons why the Pat Schroeders and the Mario Comas are out. But please also take a look at the Mario Comas. When I said I want young people to get in, look where Mario Cuomo is in his life now. Mario Cuomo, 1971 and 1972, was my lawyer. And Mario Cuomo was making his name because he understood zoning in New York State. Mario Cuomo has been a politician for a very short period of time. There were a whole bunch of us lawyers who lived in a very little community in Queens where we're trying to figure out how, I mean, I've never seen a group of people, they, they close off all the entries. Eventually, we're going to have to parachute in. I mean, it's amazing. They're very exclusive. But in any event, they don't shovel our streets, though. But what happened is Mario, we were a whole bunch of lawyers who had to hire a lawyer who knew zoning. We hired Mario, brilliant man. Absolutely, he was wonderful. We were all very impressed by him. He decided to run for mayor for the first time in 1973. All of us said, let's get behind Mario. We all go to Mario's announcement. Mario spent the whole time saying, 
God, a politician is the worst group of people you've ever met. And he walked out of the room. We said, what happened? And he decided not to announce. He ran for mayor in 77. He ran for lieutenant governor I believe in 78. These are all races. He lost, folks. He ran again. Remember that thing I said, keep running, keep running, you'll eventually win. And he ran for governor in 1981 and won and ran for re-election in 1980. Wait a minute, I've got the years wrong, 82 and 86, and he ran for re-election in 86 and won by an astounding number. Can you imagine how well he could have done if he had started when he was your age? What I'm saying to you is that politics should become a profession that when you graduate from here, when your mother says to you, what are you going to do with all that money that we've put in your education? I want you to stand up and say, I'm going to change what's going on in this country. I'm going to put my sense, two cents into it. I'm going to become a politician. When you pick her up off the floor, <laughs> then go out and do the job. And I tell you, if we get young people involved in what's going on in this country, it is going to be a better country for me and my dotage to be able to enjoy. You're here. The preceding was a unpaid announcement by the Institute of Politics, but I, I think we all second the motion, uh, Jerry, and uh, it was very eloquently stated. Yes, we'll have one more question, and I think we'll send you out in the cold. Okay, this is a question for Ed Fui, either to, either to answer first or last, and I hope the rest of you will answer it as well. Um, could you say some things or one thing that you think the press has done right in covering the election so far, and one thing the press has not done right, has done very badly. We all get to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I think the press was right to be um, tough on Gary Hart, and I think the press was wrong to be as tough on Gary Hart. <laughs> Tough act to top. Anybody else have any comments that you want to make as succinctly as that? I can't believe you did that. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, We're I'll, all I'll, I'll venture. Go no, ahead, I'll, Jerry. I think, I think the thing the press does right is, uh, is show you all the little weaknesses and, and all the rest of, um, I mean, they're showing you everything. I think that's fine. I think that's right. Uh, I think, uh, you know, trying to elicit uh, from um, Vice President Bush, Bush, God, I'm forgetting his name. How do you like that? Whew. Um, forget, uh, trying to elicit from him what was going on in the Iran arms contract. I think Dan Rather was really right in doing that because I think that's something that we all have, have the right to know so we can make an informed judgment. What I think is wrong is um, is is just focusing I thought I thought I thought focusing as much as they did on on uh, you know whose wife was pregnant before they got married and uh, who smoked marijuana and whose wife had to admit to being on diet pills. I mean, I think that's garbage. I don't even think you should report that stuff. And I don't think that that has any, any sort of influence on, uh, on a person's ability to garner up the intelligence with which to vote properly for the President of the United States. And I wish you'd leave me alone with that stuff. How's that? <laughs> Well, we're all going to have the opportunity to garner an awful lot of intelligence about the candidates for the presidency, for all the various other offices that are on the ballot in our communities this year. I hope that we at the Institute of Politics can play a part in enhancing your ability to make sound judgments in that regard. We'll try to begin next Monday night. The speaker here in the forum at 8 o'clock will be Congressman Dan Rostenkowski, reflecting on a very varied and interesting career as a congressman from the great state of Illinois and the great city of Chicago. I hope we'll see you then. Thanks for joining us tonight.